It's me, Matthias Hombauer, and this is the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast, episode 29. I got a very large old navy coat and I customized it so that I could use it to hide equipment. Show me the way out. You'll get access all area to the best music photographers on the planet, where they share their secrets, successes, and crazy stories from their rockstar life. Join me on this journey kickstart your concert photography career and start living your dream right now. Welcome to another episode of the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast. This time I interviewed Julian David Stone about his adventures as a concert photographer starting back in the early 80s. His approach to music photography was a different one than most of us are going for today. He sneaked in his camera gear taped to his legs or hidden in a specially prepared navy coat. In our interview he shares his favorite stories such as when he was hiding his lens in a big bottle of hairspray to get his equipment into a Prince concert and many more. I do not recommend to sneak your camera gear into concerts nowadays because you can get blacklisted easily and the concert photography career might be over before it even starts. However, the 80s seems to be very different and it's entertaining to hear all those stories from Julian. We will also talk about his successful Kickstarter campaign of his book No Cameras Allowed, which includes a collection of his rare shots of bands such as The Police, Prince and The Ramones. To get more info about Julian David Stone, including some of his best shots, his favorite gear, and the links to his upcoming book, go to the show notes page at hdbarb.com slash Julian Stone. So let's get started with the interview. So thanks for being my guest on the podcast, Julian. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy to be here. So great to have you here. So... Julian, you recently did a, a very successful crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter for your book, No Cameras Allowed, My Career as an Outlaw Rock and Roll Photographer. And I'm, I'm really very excited to chat uh, with you about this project. But first, let me know how everything got started. I think it was back in the 80s. And it would be great to, to get an, kind of an overview of a career as a concert photographer. So how did you get started and why music sure. photography? Sure. So yeah, it really started when I was about 17 or 18 years old. And I, you know, like most kids that age, I was very obsessed with music. And I was also interested in photography. And I sort of put the two together. And what I quickly discovered, though, that it wasn't quite that simple that, uh, you know, uh, rock stars and venues weren't too excited about the idea of you just walking in with your equipment. Mm. So uh, if it was it was a Ramones concert where I the first time that I decided to try, you know, that I was going to take pictures. I had shot a couple of other concerts, just sort of like big festivals and w where they didn't really care. Um, and the pictures weren't particularly good. And it wasn't uh, it wasn't really a passion. Then when the Ramones were coming to town, I was like, oh, I love the Ramones. I want to take <laughs> pictures of them. And I went down to the club thinking I was going to walk in with my equipment and immediately was stopped by a very large uh, bouncer who said, <laughs> you're you're not coming in here with that equipment. <laughs> And I went back to my car to get rid of it and just sort of had this moment of, you know, I think there's a way I can get around this. And I hid the equipment on my body and snuck past the bouncer, went in the bathroom, <laughs> configured everything and came out just as the Ramones were hitting the stage and started shooting. And I loved the photos and the exhilaration of sort of, you know, the, the excitement of this little, uh, mm. you know, I don't know, my own form of rebellion And after that, just started shooting uh, for years, just shot concert after concert and got more and more um, uh, complicated. I, I started getting uh, uh, what's the word for it? I, I started bringing in bigger equipment, which required that I get a little bit more clever. And what I did, I started taping the equipment to my legs and hiding it on me. Wow. And then finally, uh, after a year or two, I got a very large old Navy coat that was very long and I customized it so that I could use it to hide equipment <laughs> inside the lining. 
So that was sort of the <laughs> quick trajectory of uh, of what I was doing. <laughs> wow. So uh, what what kind of camera uh, were it back then? For sure, it was analog sure. camera. So in the beginning, you had oh yeah, definitely. One, <laughs> yeah. So you had one camera body and one lens, or. Well, I started the first few shows I did, I shot with a Canon AE one. If you remember those, the Canon AE one. And then I quickly mm -hmm. moved up to the Canon A one. And towards the end of it, like I said, once I had the coat, I started uh, smuggling in multiple camera bodies. But at first it was mm -hmm. the Canon AE one, then the Canon A one and, and, and a few different lenses. I'd bring like a 50 millimeter, you know, a small one. And then, you know, a, a 135, which was a considerably bigger lens. And then finally, Uh, towards the end of it, I had this, uh, and again, this goes back 30 years, but I think I remember it correctly. I had a beautiful Tokina 80 to 200 lens, which was, uh, wow. at the time was unusually fast. I think it was an F five, six, or even an F four. And I started mm -hmm. bringing that in. And that's when I started getting some really amazing photos when I was able to smuggle that one in. Cool. So, uh, just for the listeners that they can uh yeah have a, a clear picture in mind so you're going to a concert with your coat on with your 80 to 200 millimeter lens and your camera <laughs> in your pockets um no one recognized it that you had this equipment in your in your coat well it, it was it was a little like i said i eventually moved up to the coat what it was it was a very long coat that hung almost to my ankles And what I had done is I had punched out the, line, the, the pockets in the coat so that if I put mm -hmm. anything in it, the equipment would go all the way down to the bottom of the coat at the uh, bottom, like at the, in the lining. So they would pat my body <laughs> down and they wouldn't go all the way down. They'd figure, oh, it can't be in the coat. So that was part <laughs> right. of it. And I, and I would also tape. I, I would put stuff in my socks. You know, this was the 80s. So people wore very long sort of athletic socks that had elastic mm. so i could put a camera body there um and i also taped it sometimes to my thigh that was another okay. i would tape I a see. lens or, or a camera body it was it could get painful especially if you remember those camera mounts had some pretty <laughs> jagged edges <laughs> and um so you never had any regular photo pass so you no, always only, got only your at, access only at only, only at the at the end I started mm. for many years, like I said, doing it as an outlaw. Okay, okay. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really special. Do you think this will work nowadays? Or was, well, it, was it working because it was back in the 80s and no one really cared about it? Well, I mean, they did care. They didn't want me to do it. You know, I had to evade mm. bouncers and roadies and had some pretty crazy adventures being chased around, you know, the few times that I was spotted with my equipment. You know, today, everybody has iPhones. So they've kind of given mm -hmm. up like you can't bring in a big camera. They tell you that, you know, no professional cameras, but everybody's taking pictures with their phones and they've given up trying right. to stop that. So. Right. I see. So have you ever had a guilty consigns or did you ever feel bad about smuggling your cameras into the venues uh, when other photographers had to fight for limited press passes was this you know, something I didn't that, part that you thought about yeah you know i didn't because to start with i was very young i was 17 or 18 and i really wasn't mm -hmm. i was just like hey i'll just i'll just do this and i wasn't doing anything with the pictures except enjoying them myself and sort of building up a portfolio. But there was there was no plan like, oh, I'm going to take these pictures and then, you mm -hmm. know, profit off of them, you know, at this point or anything. It was just being 17, 18, 19 years old and just loving music and wanting pictures, you know, to bring home mm -hmm. after the show. And it, it just became a challenge. There was no I, I didn't feel like I was taking anything away from anyone because nobody was losing out because I was doing it. So. Right. And and How was it back then? Were there a lot of, of concert photographers? Because nowadays you can be in a pit with 30 to 40 other photographers. Um, how was it back then? Was, were there a couple of photographers? Because I guess it was also harder for, let's say, professional photographers to get all the equipment and everything. I mean, nowadays it's, it's rather easy to, to buy an entry camera um, or entry level camera and then go to a gig. Um, you know, th there were, there were the professionals who were in the pit, but my, my recollection at the time was there was about, there only seemed like there were three or four, you know, I grew up in the San Francisco area, which is where most mm -hmm. of these photos were taken. And it depended on the show. Obviously, if you were shooting a bigger act, there were more right. photographers there. 
Um, one of the one of the shows that I shot that I have quite a few really great pictures from is I shot the police in New York at Shea Stadium wow. in 1983. And that show, you know, there was a fair number of photographers at the beginning. But, you know, I, I, I um, you know, if you've and I assume you shoot professionally and if you, you know, when I, I said at the very end of my career in the 80s, I did go pro for a while and they put you, you know, in the pit, but they only tell right. you you can shoot three or four songs, you know, at the beginning exactly. of the show. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, I, uh, the, the, you know, once the, the show got past that, obviously the, the photographers were dispersed. But one of the things I did discover from my brief pro career that most of them kind of tried to sneak into the audience and take mm. a few shots themselves after their <laughs> right. shots in the pit, right. you know. <laughs> right. So, but you never shot from the pit when you smuggled in your cameras or i did i did eventually like i said at the very end huh. of it i because i shot all right. these shows and i had really really great pictures i eventually went pro and was hired by a couple of magazines in the bay area to shoot shows and that's when i was in the pit for uh, right. a few shows and i have to say i didn't have as much fun i, I kind of lost the excitement of smuggling mm. in the equipment that really was a big a big part of it for me was the thrill of, of sort of the challenge of it. And once mm -hmm. it became, you know, you showed up early, you got your pass, you got your three songs in the pit. And then, you know, it doesn't, then it, go it, home. it wasn't as much fun. <laughs> yeah, right. just I, didn't I, have I the, understand. And, and also when I was doing it, you know, sneaking into the shows, I was shooting only the bands that I wanted to shoot. Now you got to shoot whatever they want you to shoot, you know? Right. So, so that wasn't as fun, but you know, I, I did enjoy it too. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I didn't like that part of it. And I, and I stopped doing it, not necessarily for a bad reason, but I was about 21 or 22 and I was in college and I had to make a decision choosing between photography or the film business. And I chose mm -hmm. the film business and I'll forever wonder whether I made the, made the right choice. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. So I would love to hear some of your most memorable shootings or experiences because i think you have a lot sure. of uh, of stories to tell so maybe maybe sure. you can tell us one or two really remarkable stories and then we move on to the to the book project sure absolutely so um boy i had lots of run-ins with roadies <laughs> and security but uh some of my best ones were um about 1983 1984 at the height of duran duran's popularity um, I had just started college. I was about 19. And there was a guy who lived in my dorm who was obsessed with Duran Duran. This guy just <laughs> lived for the band. So I hadn't really planned on shooting them. But, you know, he said, hey, if I, you know, pay for gas, pay for the tickets, will you go with me to the concert and take pictures for Duran Duran so I can have them? You know, you've got all these great other pictures. And I said, sure, why not? So we go down there. The show's completely sold out. We find a, 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 an usher, a guy who's working one of the doors who says, hey, if you mm -hmm. give me like a few dollars, I'll let you into the concert. So we pay the guy in. We get in. So now I don't have to worry about smuggling anything. And he doesn't care about photographs. We're inside the show. Well, we don't have seats. So every okay. seat is taken. It's sold out. We're wandering around the arena. The lights go <laughs> down and we're kind of on a over by a railing. I pull out my equipment. I start shooting and I'm like, you know, I'm excited. I'm getting great pictures. All of a sudden, I feel this hand on my back and I turn around <laughs> and there's these two huge security guards standing there and they go, Duran Duran group security, please come with me. And my friend just <laughs> disappears. He's like a puff of smoke. He just vanishes. He takes off. These two cigar security guards take me. They take me outside of the arena and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're big guys, but they're kind of nice. You know, they're as nice as they can be as they're ripping my, you know, <laughs> taking my film and ripping the film out of my camera. So they take oh, no. all the equipment. They take all the film away. The, everything they hand me back my camera and they're like well you can go back to the concert if you want well the problem is i don't have a ticket so i have to sort of explain to them why i, I was in the concert i don't have a ticket i'm taking pictures so I, I don't remember exactly what i said but they sort of start to be sympathetic they're like okay we'll take you back in well they, they take me back to the arena and they knock on a door and it's the same door that we had paid the guy to get in <laughs> so the, 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 the guard who's working that door, the usher opens the door. He sees me standing there with two huge security guards and he completely flips out because he thinks he's about to get busted for, for taking a bribe. So, so he, he's just like, he, he, he's like trying to shut the door. He won't let me in. The guards, don't, the, the two security guards who are with me don't understand what's going on. They slam the door on me and they start having this conversation about how they're going to get me in. 
And they're like, what do we do? And they start talking about, well, maybe we'll take them in through the backstage area. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> and then they get, they get a call awesome. to deal with like some kind of security uh, incident and they just leave me. So I, it was it was crazy because I came this close to like going into the backstage area, but uh, it was just priceless. The look on the usher's face when he thought, you know, he was going to get busted. So that that was definitely one awesome. of the crazier ones. Um, another time I was shooting in a small club and I was shooting Joan Jett. You remember, well, Joan Jett's still around, mm-hmm. you know, the, the great Joan Jett. So I'm shooting her in this packed club. Like, some, you know, sometimes, you know, rock stars will go, they'll, they'll be playing a bigger venue than they'll schedule a smaller show, mm-hmm. like on an off day in a club. And this was the case, like Joan Jett was touring and playing pretty big venues, but she decided to play this club. So she's playing in a club. It's packed. And I'm in the center of the crowd and I've been able to get my equipment in and I start taking, you know, she hits the stage and I start taking pictures and all of a sudden I see a roadie on the stage looking at me and he's pointing at me like, I see you, (laughs) I see you put your camera away and I'm like, hey, I'm going to keep shooting. What are you going to do about it? I'm in the middle of this crowd. Well, the roadie jumps off the stage and charges through the crowd at me. He comes barreling straight up to me. And as he's closing in at me, I see him and I hide my equipment. I had come to that show with a friend of mine who was also taking pictures. So when the when the um, roadie got to us, he you know, he had forgotten who he had seen. He sees my friend (laughs) takes his equipment and just vanishes. He just is like takes the equipment and we're just standing there. So I, I think I snuck a couple more pictures during the show. But after the show, we, you know, my friend, meanwhile, has lost his camera. He had a beautiful pen tax or something. <laughs> oh, no. And we go back, you know, we go to the, the backstage area. We're like, hey, can we get our camera back? And they just laugh at us like, no way, buddy. You're not you're not getting uh, your equipment back. So that, that was definitely another one where, you know, you think you're wow. safe in the crowd. And I was most definitely <laughs> not safe. Um, let's see. Uh, another good one. Um, I shot Prince a few times. And I'll tell you one really funny story about how I got the uh, got my camera. And this was when I got really aggressive at the end when I sort of had like really large lenses and everything that were a little tough mm. to, you know, tape to my leg. Uh, keep in mind, this was the mid 80s and sort of the height of prints. Well, if you remember in the 80s, hair, particularly women's hair, got very big, you know, and teased <laughs> up and everything. So yeah. um, I go to this concert with a female friend of mine and I'm having trouble getting the lens to, to stay taped onto me. So she has this giant purse and inside of the purse, she has a huge can of Aquanet, which if I don't know if it was a, a type of hairspray that was used to keep your, your hair okay. up. It's this huge can. So we hid the lens inside of her purse under the can of Aquanet so that when we went up to the guard, you know, he sees this purse with this huge cylindrical object in it and he's looking at it like, what is this? And he opens the purse and he sees the can of Aquanet. It's like, oh, okay, and he lets us in. So that's how I got I, – I was able to get the lens into that, and I got some of my favorite pictures of Prince from that show. Thank so you so much was, for sharing this, this awesome stories. Yeah. <laughs> really that, that cool. Was a couple of fun ones. <laughs> really cool. Um, so you said um, by the end of the 80s you stopped shooting concerts and you went into a film. Right. Uh, and you also became an author, right? You wrote one book, a couple of books? Correct. Yeah, that, that so, sort of, I, I wrote screenplays for a number of years out here working for the studios. I'm in Los Angeles now. Most of the photos were taken mm-hmm. in the Bay Area, um, but I live in Los Angeles. And I did that for a number of years. And then about five or 10 years ago, I transitioned into writing novels. And mm-hmm. uh, that, that's what I've been doing for the last few years. And then uh, as you know, if we're, if you want to move into this, and then most recently I did this, uh, I decided to do a photo book of all those photos right. from back, you know, back in the 80s. Yeah, so when did you come up with the idea and why? Yeah, so I've been carrying around all these photos for for like 35 years. We're talking about like 10,000 images, 40, 50 different bands, all, you know, iconic bands from the 80s. So when Prince recently passed away and David Bowie, and also sadly we lost Tom Petty yesterday, mm. um, uh, but particularly it was when Bowie and Prince passed away, I put some pictures on Facebook. And people were like, where did you, you know, uh, where did you get these pictures? Why were you taking them? And I started to sort of tell a little bit of my story. And and several people were like, oh, my God, you got to do a coffee table book. And when I sort of realized that I had this unusual story, you know, because other people photographed these people at that time, but they didn't have all these wild stories that went with mm-hmm. it of sneaking the equipment in. I went, there's an idea for a book. 
you know, that I could, I could not only show the pictures, I could also tell all of the adventures that I had. Because besides the ones I've told you, there's a lot more. Right. Um, and, and so that's how it came together. Was that was the idea? It came from people asking me about it on Facebook. Okay, and what was the biggest challenge to getting the book together? You said you had so many photos, so I think the editing process might be yeah, a challenge. Yeah, you know the 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 editing and and getting you know uh, the one of the another you know was just getting it organized, getting my hands around this huge collection and finding everything, which I'm I'm still doing. Uh, I'm still finding things, um, and uh, that was a part of it. And something that was really exciting, though, was that so many of these pictures, you know, taken 30, 35 years ago, you know, I developed them, I would do a contact sheet, and then that would mm -hmm. sort of be the end of it, I might print a few, but getting them scanned now with modern technology, <laughs> right. it's just, I'm, I'm seeing the pictures for the first time. And, and I'm finding photos, frankly, that I never saw before, you know, because, mm. you know, I particularly in the beginning, I was just doing this for fun. So I'm not even sure if I necessarily even made a contact sheet of everything. I mean, I, I just found just the other day, I got some of the scans back from the lab. And I saw pictures of Joan Jett, and Howard Jones and Prince that I had, I never realized I even took. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, it's really exciting. So that that's really been the challenge, just getting it all organized and scanned and everything. And boy, The modern technology; these pictures just look amazing. I'm so mm. excited about how they look and how they're going to be in the final book. Cool. So um, you chose to do a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. Right. Um, so why this? Um, I wanted it was it was you know one to raise the money to to scan and organize it, and two mm. just to test the reaction from people. You know, it's 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 you know it's it's a box boxes of photos and negatives that I've just been keeping in a closet. And you just, you never know what the reaction is going to be. I got the good reaction of a few of them on Facebook, but I wanted to see what people, how people would react to the whole idea of it. And it's been, the reaction is beyond anything I imagined. People really loved it and really yeah, are and I mean, still I enjoying mean, it. Right. I mean, the Kickstarter campaign is now over um, or ended, but you raised 154%, I guess. Of yeah, the, my, the my, initial... my, yeah. The initial goal was to raise ten thousand, and I raised 10, close 000. to sixteen thousand. So it was, uh, it was great. It was really exciting just seeing how well. I mean, we hit mm. fully funded in just a, a few days after launching, and it was just, uh, it was just great. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting to see that um, people like this kind of project when crowdfunding photo books. Uh, another colleague of mine, he also. Uh, raised a, a photo book and it also worked out for him so it seems photo books are yeah are a good project that that people want to pay for or want to help people with to get it out there uh, no question it, you know it, it people liked the stories they like seeing the photos i mean it yeah it, it definitely had a had a strong reaction i mean it was just really exciting seeing people react to it and it was really fascinating finding out what interested people the most after all these years like which bands it was mm. particularly the police photos at shea stadium because i you know i've always liked the police quite a bit but i have i can't say i was the biggest fan on the planet i i just really liked them but oh my god apparently that show the shea stadium show is one of the if you're a fan of the police was one of their mm. legendary shows so i had all kinds of people like asking me could i do this with the photos that there's a guy doing a documentary in australia that wants to wants some of the photos and all kinds of uh, stuff that, you know, that was kind of a side thing, seeing what, what was, uh, you know, what excited people. Mm -hmm. And you were, you know, you asked me just a moment ago about the challenges. That was another challenge. Having 40, 50, 60 different bands, it's so hard to tell what are the ones that people are going to want to see. You right, know, I'm going to put right. something of everything in the book, like almost every band that I photographed, there'll be at least one, one or two photos in the book, if not more. But in terms of in the campaign, that was a real challenge of what do you highlight? You know, what are the bands that are going right. to get people most excited? And, and so that was really interesting to, you know, having, you know, I have some great shots of you too, of Prince, of the police, you know, those are sort of no brainers, but some of the other bands, you know, it was, it was, it was fascinating seeing what people reacted to. So did you test it out before the campaign? Like, as I said, on Facebook and seeing how people react to different photos and then, taking the ones that get more comments or likes or such? Um, yeah. T what I did was, this is a nice thing that um, Kickstarter allows you to do that when you create your campaign page, 
you can circulate it to people to get their feedback and their comments. And that's what I did. And so I did get a lot of comments mm. where people were like, oh, that's great that you have that picture. But I would, you know, I'd rather see instead of Icicle Works, I think you should have Elvis Costello. You know, it's that kind of back and forth. And so you sort of get a consensus. And, you know, Kickstarter also has you do a video. So that was also something right. that I had people, you know, take a look at and give me notes on. And, and I worked on that till I got it just right. Right. This would be the next question uh, about the preparation, because as you mentioned, um, if you're doing a crowdfunding campaign, doesn't matter if it's on Kickstarter or on any, any other platform, uh, there is a lot of work involved, like uh, doing oh, the yeah. promotion video and thinking about the rewards, because you don't only have the photo book, but uh, you will have different kinds of with books and bonuses and extras that you can price it at the higher level. So how long did the preparation go for you or, or what was your approach to it? Did you had did you have help with from anyone else or yeah, did you do everything um, by yourself and ask the well, people afterwards for feedback? Uh, it was kind of all of everything. You know, I have a lot of people here because I've, I've done film work and stuff. So I know people, you know, like I had to shoot a video. So I had a cameraman who has worked on, who's done some documentaries with me. So he came and shot me uh, mm. for the video from the time that I decided to do it to launching the Kickstarter campaign was 18 months. Now I wasn't working okay. on this constantly for 18 months. I worked on it for a while. And then, um, you know, there were things in my life that I had to deal with. Plus I, I, I still have my writing, so I, I wrote a first draft of a novel um, that I ended up not really liking. <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, so it was kind of like oh, I don't like this. I'm going to go back to the Kickstarter. So um, you know, the, so it it was a lot of work preparing for it, but it wasn't 18 months straight. But I have okay. to say, it, it is a, you know, for anybody that's planning on doing it, it's really exciting. But it's a lot of work, and you really got to plan that campaign. You have to like right. I really worked out a schedule. Like okay. Here's, you know, this is the date that I'm planning on opening it up where people can start donating. But before it, I had a whole plan of like, I'm going to talk about, you know, two weeks in advance, I'm going to mention on Facebook, you know, most of mm -hmm. my work was done through Facebook, because you can just reach so many people. Um, and I, you know, I started talking about the campaign. And then every few days, I would post a picture and tell a story of like, shooting you two in Ireland in 1983, or shooting, uh, Uh, Prince, you know, wh whatever, you know, and, and I tell a story that went with the photos about some of my adventures, like I had just told you about getting chased. So I use that mm. to lead up to the day. So that was, that was part of it was planning uh, so that when it launched, as many people knew about it as possible already. Right. And I mean, I, I had a look at it and uh, every day there were a, a lot of people who, who got your book or who funded your book. So I think that's also important for you as a as the guy who is doing the project, that uh, it starts really fast and not uh, waiting for for 20 days and just two or three guys have bought it and, and right. then you get nervous because you just have 30 days. But in your case, it was really, um, yeah, really a fast pace and it's really, people were really into it. Um, and I guess it's, yeah, it's it's the only way to do it, like a, to be prepared to know already what you're doing. And I once talked to someone um, who is involved in, in the Kickstarter uh, platform. And, and she also told me it's like your 30 days or whatever the Kickstarter campaign is, you need to be there present for every day. You need to know what you're doing for all your ads that you're, you're getting out. You have to contact your family and get people involved <laughs> to, to get your product. So, Oh, it, uh, it is a, it is a full, once the campaign is going, it's a full-time job. Like you right. really have to be, you know, you're, you know, because you want to get coverage in other places, you know, bloggers mm. and things like that. Right. So, I mean, it was just, you know, lots of emails and, and uh, yes, Facebook ads and, you know, you find out what works well. And, you know, in mm. the middle of it, like I said, uh, one of the things that was was really nice was the, the like I said, the reaction to the police photos. So I made a little one minute montage of using like six or seven photos of the show with with me talking over it telling the adventures that i had on that day and a bunch of fan sites for the police ended up putting that up you know so right. it was that kind of thing right. that you sort of you know find out during it She's that you, for... you just you got to keep you got to keep working it you know all the way to the end yeah no, and congrats you really did a did an amazing job thank you and it's 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 great that that you're really honest with us here and and 
telling that's not that easy because you know sometimes it's you see a kickstarter campaign okay they're raising ten thousand dollars uh it's easy it's just a, a little video and and some uh some preparation but in the end it, it's it's really hard work and i guess uh, i have no clue but i guess most of kickstarter's campaigns probably are not successful but no one knows about this you only hear the success stories <laughs> yeah so so maybe this is also like a, a little bit a distorted view on, on crowdfunding yeah it's, it's it's really not that easy no it's 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 a lot of work and it can be it can be incredibly stressful because it's you know every time you sell something you feel great but then you go you know five or six hours and you think oh my god i'm never gonna <laughs> sell another book you know it, it, and then then the worst is then you'll have a period of like a day or two where nothing happens it's, right. and you're just completely stressed out. It's like, oh my god <laughs> nobody's and then you know then you'll sell six books in two hours you know it's it's weird and there's no rhyme or reason to it you know obviously it picks up a little near the end when you know uh, mm. people are, are sort of coming in and and what was really interesting which was gratifying was that even when it was done i had several people go oh my god i'm so sorry i missed this is there any way you know to, to get the mm. book, which, you know, part of me is like, you had 30 days, you know, but, you know, I'm certainly <laughs> yeah, thrilled yeah. To, ha to have it. You know, yeah. people are busy. They have their lives. And, you right. Know, I mean, maybe they just missed it and, and yeah. just saw it the other day when it was yeah. already done. So, so how did it make you feel to see that so many people out there liked your project and, and want to bring this book into reality? It, it, it felt great. I mean, it was just, it, it, it was such a, you know, for me, it was a part of my life that I sort of closed up over 30 years ago. And it's just been really fun to see that people responded to it and that it brought back, you know, nostalgia from people that loved mm. the bands then. And uh, just, yeah, seeing that people like, you know, really love the photos and the stories and everything. Um, it, it's just been great. It's been really, really exciting seeing nice. the reaction. Mm. So if you're starting on your book project again from scratch like you have all the, the experiences with kickstarter and and you have to do another book would you do it the same way or would there be any you know different uh, parts of it would you do the the same facebook strategy or what would be the the or one of the the key takeaways out of the whole crowdfunding campaign oh, no, that's, what that's worked a, what worked and what didn't yeah that that's a great question um what I would do differently is I would have done even more prep work. Not that I didn't. I did a ton of it. You just find that you can't do too much. I think I would have done even more outreach to people. And mm -hmm. I, um, that's something I, I think you, you just you can't do enough of it. You know, uh, I, you can just there's so many different avenues to get attention because I found that I found that within probably a week or so, you kind of reach a saturation point on Facebook, even though I kept mm. doing it till the end. You know, I kept running ads and, and posting about it. You can definitely tell that people aren't liking the pictures as much. You know, they're just they've seen it. You know, they're you know, you're, right. you're only you're only you're kind of hitting the same people over and over again, even though you can target your ads. You're still your main vehicle is your own pages, you know, your your personal page. Right. And I set up a specific page for the book. Um, mm. uh, and so you realize you can just tell people aren't reacting to it the way they're, they, they've just seen it. So it's kind of trying to find another way to be, uh, fresh about it. And, and like I said, do more outreach. That's something that you, you just, mm. I did as much as I could, but I would do more in the future. Okay. Um, do you have any plans to do another Kickstarter campaign? So what about your other books as an author? Is this uh, with the publisher or self-published? Um, well, I've done a little of both. The 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 novel that I'm I have the most attention for right now is I wrote a novel about four or five years ago that is about the uh, early days of television before there was videotape mm -hmm. when everything was live in the 1950s, and it just tells the story of a writer in New York City who creates a character at, uh, called Justice Girl that becomes this huge hit and about all the machinations that happen in that book is actually in development right now to be a TV series, ironically. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so that's something that is, is going... Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's going on concurrently. It's called The Strange Birth, Short Life, and Sudden Death of Justice Girl, and it's available at Amazon.com, and that, that's been really exciting um, in terms of uh, the, the writing aspect. And in terms of doing another Kickstarter, I would love to. I mean, it was a great experience. I actually do have an interesting idea. 
ironically, for another photo book on a, a completely different subject that I want to I want to do. You know, I got to finish okay. this up. I still got a lot of work in front of me because um, one of the <laughs> things that was part of the once I hit my goal, I did a stretch goal, which is an mm-hmm. additional thing which we did meet, which is I'm going to do a gallery show and a big book launch uh, coming oh, up in a nice. few months. Uh, so I've got a lot of work to to do with all that, but I, I would definitely love to do another Kickstarter. Like I said, I have another idea mm. for another photo book. Cool. And you mentioned your book is still available. Yes. If anybody is interested, uh, you can pre-order it now. It's going to be done in early 2018. But if you go to Kickstarter, you can either go to No Cameras Allowed and you can go to the page there and follow the link to pre-order it. Or you can go straight to my website, uh, Julian David mm. Stone dot com and you can pre-order it through there and you'll get your book uh you'll get a first edition like everybody else uh a signed first edition if you like um in early 2018 cool perfect so let's follow up with some inspirational questions um, sure. what what advice would you give to your 20 year old self what would you <laughs> make different <laughs> or, 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 or is it already the dream life and you wouldn't do anything differently? Well, you know, I, I might have, you know, I, I might have kept shooting concerts because it really, it, it, at the end of it in particular, when I went pro, it was, I was, you know, I, you, you don't realize how young you are that I quit mm. doing this when I was 21. You know, I mean, that, that's just I, I crazy started, to me. I started taking concert photos uh, at 28, so you were already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I quit at 21 or 22, and I was already working for magazines. And one of the stories I have in the book, which is you know obviously particularly in the, in the early 80s, the dream was Rolling Stone magazine. That was like you mm. know the, the 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 big magazine. And I typed up a little list of my photos and I mailed it to them. You know, we're talking about like on a you know, a manual typewriter where, you know, each key pun- <laughs> practically punches a hole in the paper, you know, really, <laughs> yeah. really cheap. So I mail it off to them. And this is like 1985. I'm like 20, 21 years old. And I get a phone call at about 830 in the morning. And it's a photo editor from Rolling Stone. Oh, wow. And she says to me, I've got your list here. And we'd really like, ironically, I swear I'm not making this up. They were mostly interested in pictures of Tom Petty. So, and and I remember having the conversation with her, I'm half asleep and I can't believe this is happening and I'm writing it down. And, you know, again, this is my first contact with anything on this level. (laughs) So we're having this conversation where she's only interested in slides. Like I didn't realize that that's how most of the industry works. They prefer slides Mm -hmm. to negatives for obvious reasons. You know, they're easier to deal with. So I only had a few slides and then she starts discussing with me how I'm going to get the pictures to them. And she's real. I can tell she's really annoyed with me because like I'm taking too much time and I don't really understand. You know, I'm a kid. And she's like, no, we'll give you a FedEx number and we'll pay for the shipping, you know. So I, I shipped them off to them. And, you know, I, I I think they they sent something back like they got them from me and they, they might have even have like uh, – I don't know if they ever ran, but they, you know, they, they said, we like these and we'll be in touch again. And I would love to know, like, if by any miracle, they still have them somewhere. You know, <laughs> I imagine they're long been thrown in the garbage, but maybe they kept I, I don't know what their policy is, you know. Mm, so, right. yeah. So that was kind of a funny yeah, adventure. That, that, um, so, oh, but just sort of you were saying, like, what would I do differently or, or it's written. So, I, you know, you're young and you're stupid. And you don't realize that this is like you said, you were 28 when you started, I'm 21 and I'm 20, 21 and I'm already dealing, you know, mm. with Rolling Stone. And, you know, in hindsight, I probably wish I had continued doing it, you know? Mm. Yeah. Cause I, I did love it. It just, it just became when I was, uh, when I was in college, I was starting to get a lot of calls from, uh, one, a couple of other, a couple of magazines, not Rolling Stone to shoot concerts and it was conflicting. I was making films at that point in college and it just became unsustainable. But uh, a part of me wishes I had found a way to make it sustainable. Mm, I see. So what does success mean for you? Uh, as a photographer or as a filmmaker? Um, or... in, in general, general oh, in life, boy. I would say. I, I think in, in, in life, in all honesty, it's being lucky enough to do something that you care about and you're passionate about. Hmm. You know, that that's really been the thing is that I've been able to write about subjects that I'm very passionate about and just being able to find a way to make a living doing something that you really love to do, you know, which, again, is why I part of me regrets regrets 
mm. stopping because I really did love it. I just, I guess I loved the filmmaking at that point even more. It, it, I never looked at the photography as a career, even though it was kind of turning into one and I was definitely pursuing it. It was just, you know, it's, it's just being a kid. You just kind of do everything, you know? Right. Cool. So let's do a short q and I will ask you seven short questions and please answer them as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, Nikon or Canon or another brand? <laughs> I'll have to say Canon because that's what I shot. Right. So if you can only choose one lens for concert photography, which one is it? I, I loved using a 135. That was my main lens if you were close enough. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I eventually had that beautiful Tokina, which was an 80 to 200. Um, and, th you know, th that would be, depends on the show. Club show, the 135, and uh, big show, uh, 80 to 200. Probably mm -hmm. longer answer than you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, favorite record of all time? Record? Music record, record yeah. you mean? Music record, uh, yeah. Probably Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. Okay. Uh, is there any music photographer you admire? Well, I loved Annie Leibovitz. I know that most of her work was not um, in concert. You know, she would do those amazing portraits. And she, mm -hmm. during this period in particular, I just worshipped her work. I, I remember going to see her speak in about 85 and just... I thought she was amazing. And, I, and when I, I, I would do other photography, not just concert photography. And I remember mm. sort of trying to copy her techniques, particularly in the 80s. She would do this interesting technique where she would shoot a portrait of a person outdoors, sort of like in a low light situation with, let's say, like a one second or two second exposure. But she'd use a flash. So you would get mm -hmm. this interesting effect of the person being frozen, but they'd have sort of a shadow around them. And okay. I love that. I remember trying to imitate that. Interesting. Um, what was your coolest concert you have shot so far? Boy, there were, there, it, it, they would sort of go into different categories, like seeing Prince at the height of him in 1985 when he had the hit movie out and the album mm. was pretty amazing. The police at Shea Stadium, I have to say, was powerful. But I'll tell you one that was probably the most fun I ever had at a concert was Spinal Tap. <laughs> you know the the the, the you know the the the, the, the fake documentary the, band the fake documentary band right after the movie hit in eighty four or eighty five I think it was eighty four they did this really tiny tour they played like two or three cities we're talking about a month or two after the movie came out mm -hmm. and I cannot tell you how fun that was because you could just <laughs> they imagine. looked exactly like they looked in the movie and <laughs> you could tell that the performers were so. Like they couldn't believe themselves that this thing had reached the point that they were selling out concerts, you know? So, so that was incredible. And I, I remember there was a review in the paper the next day that I thought summed it up perfectly. This was the first line of the review in the paper in San Francisco. The, the first line was, if you miss this concert, go ahead and kick yourself. So I thought that was the, that just summed it up. It was so fun. And I, I got yeah. great photos and They did lots of the gags from the movie. And then, you know, subsequently in the 90s, they started touring a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I saw them then and they were really fun, but nothing beat this first time I saw them. It was so fun. Yeah, the, the movie was hilarious. I saw it in, yeah. a, tour bu in a tour bus when I was, was um, touring with the band and yeah. they had it with them. And <laughs> so funny. Uh, water or beer? Water or beer? <laughs> well, for concerts, <laughs> definitely beer. <laughs> for, and, for, for, shoot, for shooting water, for enjoying beer. <laughs> beer. And uh, which band is still on your concert photography bucket list? Is there any band you oh, want to question. shoot, but you, you never had the chance? You know what? I never, uh, when, when I saw, I would have loved to have shot Pink Floyd. I, mm. I, I saw them in 94 Uh, it wasn't their original lineup. And I, you know, I brought like a toy. I don't even know if I think my friend actually brought a little camera. I wasn't shooting it. I went through to enjoy it. So I would have loved to have shot them in their peak in the 70s. Definitely. Okay. And uh, what is your must have tip for someone who wants to start out as a music photographer nowadays? Ah, boy. You know, I don't know what to say. You <laughs> don't, know, don't, I, I don't, mean, sm don't smuggle your camera <laughs> into yeah, the, into the know, idea. 
Yeah, you know, I would imagine today it's a little easier because you can, you know, you can take some pretty amazing photos with it. It's astounding what your iPhone mm. can take. I mean, just playing around. I have a little tiny Leica point and shoot that I bring into the concerts, and it's unbelievable mm. the pictures you get with that. You know how 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 digital photography uh, has reached that point. I, you know, I would say kind of do what I did. You know, which is I I was sneaking it in, but I built a portfolio, and then when I contacted some of these magazines when i was like 20 they were like oh my god these are fantastic and hired <laughs> me should, on the spot uh get a typewriter and, and write the, <laughs> yes. a letter to the rolling stone magazine yeah <laughs> oh god perfect thank you yeah. thank you so much julian for all these great stories they were hilarious oh, and uh, yeah, I'm, my I'm really pleasure yeah it. and and thank i, you I so hope much. people will 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 check it out and it'll it's yeah. a, no cameras allowed my career as an outlaw rock and roll photographer Definitely looking forward to this book. Thank you so much and all the best for the future, Julian. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. This was a brand new episode of the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast. And before you go, I want to say a huge thank you. So here is where you can find me. I am Matthias Hombau and basically all over the internet on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And you will find my blog at www.howtobecomearockstarphotographer.com or simply htbarp.com It's also super important to share my podcast with your friends. Subscribe to iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher and or Pocket Casts so that you don't miss any new episodes. I'll publish an interview once a week from the best music photographers on this planet to help you kickstart your concert photography career. And if you're awesome, please leave a review on iTunes. This will make my How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast more visible and you can actively help to grow our concert photography community. The last place where you can check it out and get some additional value is in my newsletter, which is howtobecomearockstarphotographer.com slash VIP. This is where I put content out before it hits my social platforms. So this is sort of the insider track. Leave me comments all over the internet. I'm tracking them down and try to answer every single one. A huge thank you again for listening to my podcast and I'm looking forward to the next episode. I hope you'll join me. In the meantime, go out and shoot some concerts. Rock on, Matthias. <laughs>